in a debate called How Will Science and New Technologies Change the World in Coming Years? So please join me in welcoming Artemis Westenberg, who is remaining on stage, as well as Erin Nickerson, please. Our very own Dr. Milana Ratajczak as well. <laughs> Uh, Patrycja uh, Karwowska. Joining us online are going to be Dr. Ariana Murray and Ilaria Cinelli. And the debate is going to be moderated by Dr. Alexandra uh, Bukawa. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again, Artemis, for excellent <laughs> keynote. Actually, covered um, um, most of the topic that uh, we would like to to discuss uh, uh, today. Um, I uh, I had a little bit of a problem with that uh, with the the, uh, the topic of this debate because it's very broad, it's very multi-dimensional, and actually we could speak uh, speak all three days about that <laughs> without uh, even. Uh, um, uh, fulfilling all the uh, all the aspects, uh, um, but uh, we have an hour, approximately an hour, to to have a talk. So uh, I'd like to uh, ask you some uh, some questions. Uh, first, questions to Artemis, of course, because we are all uh, waiting <laughs> impatiently for Artemis uh, one mission uh, to to the moon uh, to be launched. It has been uh, scrapped two times already. The first attempt was on 29th of uh, uh, August and the second one on the 3rd of uh, September. So they are still um, solving the, the issues. But what I wanted to ask you, Artemis, uh, is that uh, uh, this mission is, uh, uh, that there are a lot of hopes about uh, going back to the moon and forward to, uh, to, to Mars. So. If we are thinking about changing the world, we know how Apollo changed uh, that technology. We wouldn't have these small devices if it weren't for Apollo. So what is your opinion about uh, Artemis? Uh, uh, do you think it will be so groundbreaking as much as Apollo is? I'm going back to Copernicus now. If we step on Mars, and we, we not just go there for some pictures and then, you know, skadoodle back. You know, we're there to do science, exploring. Uh, we stay there for four weeks or 18 months, either one, because it has to do with the orbital mechanics of both, both planets. Otherwise, you travel uh, to Mars for six months. You are there for, I don't know, three weeks. And then you'll go back for 20 months. It's a bit like flying to Sydney for dinner. It's not very efficient. Also, if we're talking health of uh, astronauts uh, flying back for 20 months would be much more a problem than staying on Mars, even if Mars is dangerous and hard to live on. What I believe is if we step there, we've become a two-planet species. We have to re-evaluate who we are. You know, it, it's, we're no longer, you know, these Earth dwellers that are just you know, eking out a existence in Europe at the moment because of the high food prices and high, high energy prices. You know, life is hard, really hard. Um, we will inspire a lot of people like Apollo did. I mean, Apollo inspired people that were living in abject poverty. And if astronauts asked them, why would you be inspired by, by you know, us going to the moon? Your life is so hard. People would say, because it gives hope. It gives hope that there is more, that there isn't just me eking out my existence, that as a humanity, we have a future. Now, I do believe that the moment we step on Mars, we see that, you know, we are, we are more than just, you know, these people, you know, fighting each other also on Earth. But also what I believe, if you go to Mars, there are no multinationals there to tell you what to do. Because they're there, but like I said, it's at least three minutes before you hear them scream perhaps even 22 minutes, and then you can always ignore them, pretend you didn't hear, message not received. What it means, though, because I might be joking about it, it means that people there, perhaps not the first mission, but the later missions, they will forge their own society. And that society 
We'll need everyone. It doesn't matter whether, you know, on Mars you had a little accident and now you walk with a limp because we still need your contribution for the simple reason, otherwise we die as a group. So suddenly, whether you're male or female, your skin color, your age, you know, cripple or not cripple, will be no longer a defining factor for you as a human, for you as a part of society. And that is, I hope sincerely, that Mars will bring us and that will teach us here, Earthlings, that hey, society could be different. We could, you know, really appreciate each and every one of us instead of, you know, having all these divisions. And that's what I hope will bring. Like Copernicus brought us another idea of, you know, what, what the role of humans in the universe is. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is also my view on, uh, on that. And actually, the next question I wanted to, to address to uh, Nickerson, uh, and that uh, uh, also following the, the subject of, of Artemis uh, program, it's uh, very different from Apollo in many aspects. Uh, it, uh, it is not to put our boots back on, on the moon. It's to to, be, uh, to become present uh, constantly on the moon, and then to make it as a stop for, uh, for a future Mars uh, mission. But the other uh, dimension of, of Artemis uh, program is that uh, now it is run in a very broad international cooperation, unlike Apollo, which was purely US-based uh, uh, program. We already have 21 signatories of Artemis Accords, including Poland. And uh, uh, actually, also from my uh, practical uh, experience, NASA is very open, and we discuss a lot, and we have constant contacts, technical discussions uh, uh, on that. But um, on the other hand, so, so we are going together. But on the other hand, we have a very special uh, international situation, which is a, a little bit deja vu from the, for the, cold, from the Cold War times. So I know this is not an easy question uh, to, to ask, but I wanted to ask you whether, uh, in your opinion, going to the moon and then to Mars would change the, the way we perceive ourselves as a, as a species and that a, a truly uh, human uh, Earthlings uh, uh, community will become a reality. I absolutely hope so. And that's why, you know, as a representative of the United States government, I can say that we're very excited about the um, cooperation that's being done under Artemis. But that didn't just come, obviously, from whole cloth. International space cooperation has a long history of more than 50 years that started, you know, in the 1960s at least. And really, as a direct outcropping of some of the political tensions in the Cold War and an attempt to, um, you know, cooperate between peaceable countries on Earth. <laughs> and if you look at the International Space Station that we've already talked about today, you know, I would say that that is the most successful example of international cooperation in the history of the world. And it didn't just start after the Cold War in 1998. Again, it was decades of cooperation that led up to that in, you know, between the United States, Japan, 11 European countries, Russia, and Canada. And so to see this now the broadest and most diverse cooperation in history under the new Artemis program is extremely exciting and can only lead <laughs> to you know, a change in the way that we view ourselves. Um, I think what excuse me, will be extremely important, however, is that we have a lot of work to do on cooperation beyond just the Artemis program that will feed directly into that. And that includes international standards that have to be implemented uniformly across the world if we want to have the safe and peaceful use of space, including anything ranging from space debris, um, which Dr. Westerberg already talked about, to the safe use of uh, data and protecting privacy for all of humanity. So thank you. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, what we are uh, talking to NASA now, they, they call all this bunch of activities Moon to Mars uh, um, initiative, let's say, in, uh, which Artemis is, is only a part, and that's true. We are uh, uh, now divided into four working groups on four different subjects, including standards, infrastructure, habitation, transportation, science, uh, which we cannot forget. 
If I may add, there was one very important pillar that I failed to mention, and we see it right outside, which is that the cooperation is obviously not just between governments, but it's between the private sector, academics, non-governmental organizations, and even students that are combining math and science studies with imagination and creativity and making contributions in all kinds of ways. Yeah, uh, for the next speaker, I would like to also re uh, refer to what is happening outside that, uh, and that uh, Artemis already mentioned in, the, in, in her excellent keynote, that we will need uh, human-robot cooperation uh, for uh, having the exploration uh, successful, both on the moon and on the Mars. Uh, you are part of the Peraspera project, which is uh, uh, which is meant to create the roadmaps for, uh, for the future robotic exploration, which is not only the robots on the planets, but also the orbital uh, robotics, uh, uh, main maintenance, servicing, debris mitigation, uh, and so on. So m maybe you could share with us uh, the Peraspera view on the future of robotics uh, development. Um, I fully agree that the space robotic domain is, is one of the domain with uh, most uh, opportunities for future, with most development opportunities. As you mentioned, the Peraspera Consortium um, is working very hard to try to map all of this wide uh, domain and all of this wide area of uh, space robotic. As well, uh, they are trying to find this critical risk and critical area where we have to do something now and where we have to develop. Um, if we talk about the trends in space robotics, uh, for sure we have to mention the on-orbit servicing. This is one of the main technology which is developing right now all over the world. There's most of the organization in the world as well as in Europe. We have a European Commission as well as European Space Agency, we are, which are currently working on the on-orbit servicing missions. So in future, for sure, we will need autonomous and robotic technologies to allow the servicing of the old satellites which are now on orbits, which will be in future the space debris, and we have to face it and do something with this space uh, debris, and the autonomous and the ro robotic technologies will be crucial for that. Um, but also the trend is um, terrestrial technology, the planetary robotic, because we have the Artemis back to moon mission and also beyond missions. So the trend in future and the need will be also robotic technologies to enable human presence on the moon and also on other planets, um, as well that collecting samples technologies and also some research for terrestrial researchers' technologies. So in space robotics in future, we can expect a lot. And this is the domain when we, the ideas, the new ideas are really uh, needed. So I think we can expect, expect unexpected. This is, could be a really surprise in future what the robotic could bring to us in future. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I fully agree that this is one of the uh, areas which, which is close to my heart. I, I come from robotics uh, background, so, so robots are, uh, are very close to my heart. And uh, yeah, we will have to uh, solve a lot of problems uh, here and uh, develop a lot of new uh, uh, solutions uh, for the technology itself, uh, but also for the interaction with, uh, with humans. And uh, that is now I would like to, uh, to turn uh, into this human aspect of, uh, of the exploration. And uh, I, uh, we have uh, uh, Ilaria uh, Sinali on, uh, and uh, Ariana on the, on the screens. OK, if maybe this, this way will be better. And um, uh, I would, would like to ask a first question to Ilaria, a very uh, scientific one. Uh, well, uh, the uh, space is an uh, extremely hostile environment for a, for a, uh, for a human. Uh, there is a radiation, there is no air, there is very cold uh, there, and, and so on and so forth. And this is also the truth for both the Moon and, uh, and Mars, which are very different from, uh, from Earth. So what do you think would be the most important thing uh, that, that would enable us uh, to live on the other celestial bodies? 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. My name is Ilaria Sinelli. Well, you ask a very hard question indeed. <laughs> and I don't know if I have any time to answer to all of this, but um, I'll make you... Um, Sorry, I will just decrease in the volume of my computer because I hear my back, myself back and forward, which is not really useful to any conversation. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the most important part is to consider and to um, try to not be too much rigid on medical standard in a way to allow several people you know, with broader performance compared with the population of the current International Astronaut Corp in a way to, um, you know, expand the knowledge in uh, space medicine. Because right now we know a little bit more about space medicine and the ISSS provides amazing information to know about human health, which is great. But we have very ambitious goal. And so the, it is hard, you know, to produce and to anticipate the technology that is needed, um, uh, for example, in human health on the moon or Mars. If we don't have enough data or enough representation of anything, anything that could happen on this planet. And so if you're going to be a little bit flexible in medical standards and we allow a broader population to access space, it would be way easier from a scientific point of view to understand, you know, condition, medical condition or scenarios that could become a threat to a person. And so, um, uh, just building on what you know, previous speakers have said, specifically Artemis, um, the, the ambitious goal of even establish human presence on Mars, it's, it's for humanity. That's why we do that. And there are uh, advantages for aiming to such ambition goals in developing uh, technology that embrace any sort of engineering, but here I'm talking specifically to medicine and healthcare technology. And the reason is, is this one, if we are able to guarantee it to enable humans to survive in a very hostile environment on another planet, then we can actually make our planet even better. And there is a sort of alignment between the ultimate goal so we could achieve in, um, in, 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 in uh, you know, a, a space exploration, in advancing human exploration of space, and the current sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And so we are heading towards different goals because they are, you know, one on Earth, one on space. However, the results could benefit humans regardless of the location where they are. And here is, is the beauty. If we are became a little bit flexible with medical standards, we could allow even more transfer of space technology and advances of space medicine back to the ground population. Because this, the, the efforts in healthcare are not just for four people they are sent on a, a spacecraft for, 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 a, for a Mars mission. They are for the ground population. But astronauts right now are people with higher physical and mental performance. And that means that any results that we can take from research might not be directly applicable or representable of the ground population because we have people with diseases. And right now, having a disease is very common, it's very popular. Okay, even mental health can, can be classified as a disease, but this is, you know, there is some limitation in transferability. But I want people on the ground to be healthy and I want our species to advance in the future, in the future years, even when I'm not going to be there. And I want, I want to just make sure that there is the base. And, and then, you know, the society is aiming towards that goal because anyone on the ground and in space deserve, you know, access to health care, deserve quality medical care, deserve quality education. And we got, we got to give them, uh, we got to give them all of them because we are in a position of doing that. I don't think the space community and the, the ambition goals of, you know, in coming the human exploration activity lead us to reevaluate the principles of our society and so to think differently. But if we do not reevaluate principle, then we can make our society better. <laughs> and so there are several challenges that are linked to, you know, adapting and to leading to the hostile environments. But one of the first is to recognize that we are human beings. And when I, uh, when I train in my crew and I expose myself to server extreme environment, um, you know, you, you, want, you want humans around you. You don't care if they're not your family, if you just met them, if they are from a different nationality, if, if they are, it could be, you know, minorities in your society, you don't care, you just want the crew, you just want the unity 
around yourself because we are human beings. That's what we do. We stick together and we try to survive to help each other. And for my crew, I will do whatever it takes to make them safe just because they will do the same for me. So there is a way and then there are some aspects of rebuilding and recreating what people could interpret as international societies incur. There are some synergies here, but this is an old aspect that we got to consider when thinking about, you know, um, uh, increasing the population that could have access to space. So it's not just about medicine, it's about anthropology, it's about philosophy, it's about society. So there are several dis different aspects. And I think <coughs> the greatest part and the greatest fun, and, and here I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be quiet and after I promise it. But I think the great fun of from, from a scientific point of view will be whenever we are sending people with diseases in space, people with cancer in space, people with cardiovascular diseases in space. They are of course compatible with the challenges of human space flight. But this is where the fun begins for scientists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I want to, to turn to Adriana Marai. Uh, I know that you are highly involved in uh, uh, analog missions in uh, preparing ourselves uh, for uh, for a living uh, in in space, I am sailing a bit uh, offshore to do offshore sailing, and I know how hard it is to survive. Uh, I don't know eight, uh, ten, twelve people on a very small uh, environment, which is uh, totally separated from the the outside uh, world. So uh, I I would like to ask you about your uh, uh, your opinion on uh, on this. Uh, let's say, societal aspect of, uh, of uh, space travels, human space travels for long distances. It takes almost a year to get to Mars. Thank you so much, Alexandra, and thanks for a brilliant uh, keynote that has set the stage for this discussion, Artemis. So um, let me first say this is a certainly not a boring time we are living in. This is an unprecedented era for humanity. On the one hand, expanding beyond Earth is within reach. Um, on the other hand, we face some of the greatest challenges we've ever faced as a species, whether that's uh, climate change and not unrelatedly the increased prevalence of pandemics, which increases already existing poverty and inequality. And when we couple this with the unpredictable changing climate, um, we cannot uh, deny that we face extreme challenges here on Earth. So I think hand in hand with the dealing with these challenges is the role that exploration plays um, in coming up with new solutions. So let me skip back to 1957, which I wasn't uh, alive to, to witness the moment in history, I think, which must transform people's minds to know that there is an artificial satellite in orbit around our planet. But uh, the reason I mention that is the year after Sputnik was launched by the Soviets in, in the late 50s was the first solar powered satellite by the US um, just a year later. So, of course, burning fossil fuel and other kinds of fuel sources are not practical in space. But where would we be today in terms of mitigation of climate change if we had not launched the first solar powered space technology more than 50 years ago? So this is just one example uh, to highlight, I think, how exploration drives new ways of thinking that we often can't predict how they can impact, but later on they do. So I know you're asking about the human element, but let me say I have a background in theoretical physics, um, but I'm now involved in an organization I established called Proudly Human, and we are running the off-world project in some of the most extreme places on Earth. So while we look at low Earth orbit and Earth orbit and see almost half of all nations on Earth have satellites either of their own or shared resources um, in orbit around Earth. So in terms of low Earth orbit, we have a fair representation. Like I said, almost half of all countries on Earth um, have some activity in low Earth orbit um, of their own technology. However, the human presence in Earth's orbit remains limited to North America, Europe, Japan, and of course, China with their recently launched uh, own space station. And this, I believe, and we've heard this from other speakers, so thanks for setting the stage, needs to shift. We are to become multiplanetary, I believe. Mars is the first step, and we have to increase the diversity of people participating in this if we are to reimagine ourselves as a society rather than uh, to uh, 
perpetuate inequality. So I'm, I'm based in South Africa. I'm proudly African. Of course, I travel a lot and interact and collaborate globally. Um, but what role can Africa play in our expansion beyond Earth? And so I've established the Off-World Project to look at the kinds of technologies that already exist that sustain groups in extreme places. And here I think we need to reflect on the billions of people on Earth living without clean water, without nutritious food, without reliable power or internet connection, and think about that these are the basic resources required for human life, whether we are in the desert, whether we are on the surface of Mars, whether we are in Antarctica, or on the surface of, of Mars or the Moon. Um, so let me, let me end it there, but uh, we will be running a documentary series of the experiments we run. We've got African technology partners as well as technology partners from all around the world. Um, contributing to our infrastructure, which is uh, power, so hydrogen fuel cells, solar power, atmospheric water extractors, wastewater management systems, smart indoor agriculture, IoT systems monitoring everything from our infrastructure to our heart rates. And we will go to uh, the driest deserts, the coldest polar areas, and also live under the ocean for some period. Um, but that's enough for me for now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, great, uh, great remark on uh, on uh, on the, how the exploration will actually help uh, also here to solve all the problems we have on Earth and how space technologies are already helping to better understand the world we are living in. And um, last uh, <laughs> last speaker, Dr. Milana Ratajczak, uh, you are an astronomer. So um, I had a question to you, and sometimes when you look at the distant uh, worlds, uh, you m we probably you might uh, think of, uh, of other uh, life uh, somewhere there. So I, I prepared a question for you about uh, uh, what if we meet uh, other civilizations, and could we even communicate with, uh, with them, uh, talk to them, have any uh, common language? But please also feel free to comment on other aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, that's a tough question because, like, talking about extraterrestrial civilization is worth to start uh, with saying that. Uh, oh, sorry to say that, but we are no, we are not special. So, starting with a Copernican principle, so we are basically inhabitants of a very ordinary planet, so we're beginning a very ordinary star in a very ordinary uh, galaxy. So, um, we know um, that thanks to that principle, well. It led Copernicus to uh, to to create the theory uh, that we that, that that this is true, the heliocentric one, and also Einstein to to work on the general relativity. Uh, but on the other side, so uh, so we know if uh, if the conditions that happen to the Earth happen in any other well in any other place, the life should evolve there and should evolve probably in a more or less the same time scale that that it evolved on on, on the Earth. On the other side, uh, we also know that we don't have any sign from any uh, civilization, and we don't even have a clue if they exist. Uh, so there is this Fermi paradox saying, "Where are they? Why? Why don't we see them? Why they don't want? Why, why they don't communicate? If we don't understand them, or maybe they don't want to communicate, right?" So there are several things, and. Uh, coming back to the to the science, so okay, we have some estimations. So we know that there is plenty of extrasolar planets uh, in our galaxy, not only in our uh, galaxy, because we start to discover them also in other galaxies. Uh, so basically, we know what kind of conditions should be meet to to have a simple form of life to to evolve, and uh, and we also have some estimation of. Uh, um, of some conditions that has to be meet uh, if we want a given civilization to communicate. So there is this famous Drake equations that uh, let us estimate the number of uh, uh, intelligent civilization that should be able to communicate with us uh, in our galaxy. And there are various estimations, but uh, we know there should be some, basically. And one of the factors there is actually the uh, time scale of, uh, for, for this given civilization to, uh, to actually to be able to communicate. So now we come to this communication that you ask about. So uh, looking at the Earth, we know that we communicate outside, outside Earth for let's say 100 years, right? This is how we use radio wave and so on. 
and uh, and we come to the problems that uh, okay we listen we have uh, well we had uh, uh, SETI and also other pro projects and so on we also send messages like Arecibo message and Voyager probes and Pioneer probes and so on uh, but there is nothing that we have for sure right now because there are the several problems one of them is medium so we as human communicate using either the the wavelength the sound wavelength or a light and a given frequency. So we know that even we cannot understand, we cannot hear some voices of, for example, animals that live here on Earth because we are, uh, we are sensitive on a given range of frequencies. So this is one problem. Another problem is basically the language. So we assume that some, some uh, uh, civilization may create some language, uh, but we don't know what kind of language and we have to decode it. And this is where, I don't know, crypto analysis and linguistics comes to, uh, to, to play a role. And also uh, we have to understand. So we know that we use the same language, let's say, but we often don't understand each other, right? So <laughs> that's another step that we have to see. So there are several uh, challenges. So um, Honestly, in my opinion, I believe that even if we don't communicate with the, well, we don't have any messages from other civilizations, I believe they do exist. Like, um, but on the other side, I think it's uh, highly improbable that we can communicate in a, knowing the technology that we have right now. So the future technology is another, another thing, but uh, right now I wouldn't be expecting to get any message from extraterrestrial civilization, although I believe they are there. So. Uh, the universe is a, is a huge place, and it would be an awful waste of space if we were there alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, we are uh, uh, close to the finish, but uh, I would like to give you, uh, all of you, a chance uh, to make one final remark, uh, uh, let's say one, two sentences per, uh, per speaker, about uh, the, the topic in general, how space exploration uh, and what is happening now uh, in these exciting times would really change the world. And uh, maybe we will make the, the order all the way around now. So, um, Elena. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, from the perspective of an astronomer, and especially a person that actually looks for also extrasolar planets, I believe that the future uh, will bring us finding a life in the universe apart from the Earth and apart from this science of life, the traces of life that we, that we know in our solar system. So I believe we'll find life on other exoplanets. And that could... Uh, and, and the question is how that will change our life. So. I believe that will basically change our perspective. Again, that we are not alone. But on the other side, again, it's what I said before, it, it won't change our way of feeling because we, we cannot communicate, that's the thing. But that would be the proof. Uh, we still don't know what we are looking for, but if we find out what we are looking for and we have the signs so we can say that uh, the life exists there and uh, that's the first step. To, to, to see the future in a bit different colors. Okay, thank you. Adriana? <laughs> so as an Origins of Life researcher that's now doing more of exploration activities, um, what a brilliant time in the history of life on Earth to be alive where we might detect evidence of life on it and furthermore establish life there in our lifetimes. Um, on the other hand, as I've mentioned, we have a lot of challenges, so let me not reiterate those. But if we reflect on what it is to be human, I think this is an era to do that. Um, how do we define ourselves? Um, and I think our ability to imagine a world beyond the reality that we are currently experiencing um, is perhaps the most important and fundamental part of being human, this imagination, this aspiration that we have which drives us to explore space, you know, whether that's across oceans, over mountains, and now to other planets. So this is something to be proud of, this is something to celebrate. But another fundamental aspect of being human, I think, is our compassion, um, our ability to work together, to collaborate, to cooperate. And I think this, although we live in this global era with the internet, where we all feel like we're together on one planet, um, I think the idea of feeling a sense of unity with our local communities was really important. Um, and the idea of teams going with just a small group, maybe 10 people, maybe more, into an extreme place like the surface of the moon or to Antarctica where we plan to go to build a camp from scratch. Um, I think it's not in spite of the harshness of the environment. It's, 
It's often because of the harshness of the environment that we see the best in ourselves coming out. A unified team, um, people with a common purpose, people with compassion, people who work together to achieve goals. Um, and whether we're looking at a planetary scale or at a small community level, I think it's, it's really an era to, to celebrate our compassion and our ability to work together as humans. Um, and I think space exploration is a great manifestation of that collaboration. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. And Ilaria? Sure, thank you for the question. And so I think that we will discover humanity itself. Humanity is evolving and probably we will find out what humanity really means for human, human beings and the universe itself. And that comes with two great things, uh, in, in, my, in my opinion. One is hope. And because we don't have, people are starving on hope all around the world, regardless of their societal status and, and, you know, and the country. And another thing is about sharing. In space, we have to share oxygen, we have to share water, we have to share any sort of resources. So even if we don't like to do that on the ground, so on our planet, we, we, we have to do that in space. So if we, you know, space, you know, in, in, this, in these ways will teach us how to share and probably we will become a better humanity in, in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia? <laughs> Um, so, from space robotic perspective, I am quite sure that we will have a plenty of on-orbit servicing mission in future, and we finally face the debris mitigation problem. Uh, I hope there will be a whole market for such on-orbit servicing the old satellites, and for sure we will uh, develop the planetary robotic technology and uh, able the human presence on other celestial bodies. And for sure, it will impact on our er life on Earth. But how? It will be the surprise for the next years. So we will see. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. For those of you who are live streaming, you can't see that actually the future just walked into this room. Mm -hmm. I see mm -hmm. students ranging from very young to, um, you know, uh, into university age. And these people are really the future. So we're looking to you to, you know, and I'll just mention that I have a nine year old son and one of our favorite activities is to look up the new images of the James Webb telescope that is looking to our future by looking at our past. And it is a reminder that we, as we go forward in this space exploration, to recognize how little we know and to understand that we can change the assumptions and the you know, knowledge of our entire universe uh, in relation to ourselves in ways that Copernicus did hundreds of years ago. So it's very exciting, I agree. Thank you, and Artemis. Well, to be honest, and hey, all the youth here present, hear me, you are going to make the difference. As a group, yeah. But if you look at what's happening in the last, you know, several years, Greta Thunberg, you know, and Malala, you actually are going to show us what I have believed all my life, one person can make a difference and therefore shoot. That's my assignment to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. It was a, a great discussion. Uh, it's a pity that we have to, to, to finish uh, now, uh, but uh, thank you uh, all uh, again for your participation.